As random suburban sprawl spreads rapidly into the last open areas around San Diego, California, the wildlife is left with no place to go. Wild animals are forced into a tragic conflict with man that they cannot win, as a group of motorists found out on one spring morning. Some of the footage in this story was taped as events unfolded on May 19, 1991. south on Highway 805 was off-duty Sheriff's Deputy Lisa DeMeo. It was a uh, late Sunday morning, very heavy traffic for that time of day, and it's very fast. I remember seeing a deer run across the freeway towards the median, and it was struck by a car that was next to me. It just happened so quickly, the car kept going, and I started calling for help in my police radio. Lisa's call came into the San Diego Sheriff's Communications Center. It's ICHT, a uh, large deer was just struck southbound I-805. It's still alive. So far, is it going to need to be dispatched or can fishing game save it, you know? Uh, no, it's on its back. I can't tell. Uh, I don't know about this stuff. But the nearest fishing game officer was more than an hour away. Gene Chaffin was also driving south on 805. From my truck, I could see traffic divert around an object in the road. But as I got closer, I realized it was a deer in the road. And so I put on the flashers and managed to stay in front of the animal so I would block traffic. Two other drivers, Steve Montgomery and Roger Lamperson, also stopped to help. I got traffic stopped in the two slow lanes. And the three gentlemen stopped, picked her up got her off to the shoulder, far off the shoulder, um, as far away from traffic as possible. The main thing was supporting her weight and keeping out of the line of the fire of the legs because the hooves are very strong and, you know, someone could have been pretty badly damaged. Got her, you okay? Yep. The front right leg was shattered. The deer was suffering badly. I mean, you could see it was frothing at the mouth, screaming, and the, and the scream just drove you nuts. It was in just such terrible pain. I was raised in a country atmosphere on a farm, so I think I know at what point an animal can be saved and can't be saved, and you just knew that, you know, she couldn't be repaired. It just wasn't, wasn't one of those deals where you just fix an animal's leg and she goes on her merry way. Among the California Highway Patrolmen who responded was Officer Gregory Mullendor. The deer was in, it was in real bad shape, and uh, it was very apparent that it wasn't just a simple break. There was a uh, bare bone there, and there was muscle tissue, and uh, it, was, it was high up on the animal's leg. And uh, certainly the only humane thing to do would be to put the animal out of its misery. I'll do it. Okay. As soon as she calms down. And, and it was over. It uh, he just a pop, and it was over. I don't mind telling you that I didn't feel real good at that point. I just simply got up and walked away about 15 feet and stood there. It was upsetting, period. And I was glad that it was over, but it was the right thing to do. So I, I hope that he doesn't lose any sleep over it because he did the right thing. At that point, the deer's stomach started to actually kick. And I mean, it was visible, it started moving. You're not gonna believe this, but she's pregnant. Suddenly the focus shifted to the possibility that might be a, a living creature inside her. And what can we do about this? I knew that it was a matter of minutes before that farm died of oxygen deprivation. So I ran to my truck and in my tool pouch, I, I keep a utility knife. And it didn't take all that long to cut her open and get the little fawn out. It was in the uh, birth sack, so to speak. And so I had to rip that open to get to it. And I noticed that its heartbeat was fine. In fact, it was really rapid, but it wasn't breathing at all. Any kind of rags? I took my fingers and just got some of the mucus away from its mouth, and then I had to do a kind of a mouth to snout resuscitation, get a few breaths into it to see if it would come around. Oh, Look at this. Come on. Come on. He's breathing. 
<laughs> when he took his first breath after reviving it, that was a great feeling. It was, it was really, it was like, yeah, it was a great feeling. I mean, I thought, wow, we saved one. That was a once in a lifetime uplifting feeling. It was a hot day and I was concerned about dehydration. So the first thing we tried was the water. It wouldn't take any water. We even tried to get it to suckle the mother and it wouldn't do that. There you go. There you go. So we managed to squeeze some milk in the little bottle cap and we managed to get what, I, you know, what we felt was a little bit of milk down the, uh, the fawn's throat. There you go. There you go. Oh yeah, she's swallowing it. Yeah. She's swallowing it. She is swallowing it. Maybe a few minutes later, uh, it, it let out a little squeak, its first sound, and I've never heard a, a newborn fawn squeak, and uh, it was beautiful. It was like a baby's first cry. Someone volunteered to name Freeway. We, we all kind of chuckled over that one, but it stuck right at that moment. Hey, he's ready. I need to listen. Let me out of here. Look at that. She wants to get up. Oh, yeah. yeah she does. She wanted to get up. She wanted to walk. She wanted to uh, stretch out. Look at the face. Look at the face. Freeway. Welcome to the world. <laughs> Freeway, the newborn fawn was taken to a nearby exotic animal hospital and examined by Dr. Jeff Jenkins. We cleaned the fawn up and cleaned and sterilized its umbilical cord. We then um, allowed Gene, since he was the uh, foster uh, father, to cut the umbilical cord, and, uh, um, which he did. Both Gene and Lisa had become very attached to the little fawn. They both were glowing with the whole idea that this little fawn had survived. The smiles would go ear to ear on these two as we worked on the deer, and it, and it did better and better, the little fawn. The next day, Freeway was moved to the home of Wildlife Center volunteer, Mary Faust. Oh, Freeway drinks goat's milk. We heat it up and feed her every two hours. She's very healthy, very active, loves to run and play in the yard. She's just doing super. <laughs> I think Jean did something remarkable out there, something uh, beyond what most people would have done. To me, he's a hero. When I see her, I think, wow, she's, she's lucked out. It's incredible she's alive, and I hope that you know she can go free again, but even if she ends up in captivity because she's too imprinted to people, I think it's a win for her, and it's a good feeling to see her nowadays. We can mix wildlife and people if we do it right, and not just blindly draw our straight lines on paper. We have little corridors of habitat that we leave, leave them undisturbed, don't develop them, and it allows animals to pass through underneath the freeways and go east to the more open terrain. There's no reason not to. This whole experience with this deer was probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Something like that only happens to you once in your lifetime. It'll probably never happen to me again. So it was, it was definitely a wonderful experience. There's going to be a point where she has to go. And um, we're going to miss her. She's a real sweetheart. Mm -hmm.